and that was a very popular book. Uh, the main character, Theo. Theo. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what that book deals with? Theo, uh, the book goes backwards. Mm -hmm. It starts with a 37-year-old Theo. It's basically about a man who can't, who can only feel affection through abuse. Mm -hmm. He needs to be abused in order to feel affection. And it chases, it traces this person backwards from the age of 37 to 10. Mm -hmm. So it goes back through time to his relationships and then uh, to the group homes that he was raised in mm -hmm. and finally to an interaction with his mother and father at the age of 10. Uh, it's a lot about sadomasochism. Mm -hmm. It's a lot about group homes and, and the, the things that stay with you from the group homes because mm -hmm. not it's not like you're ever not a group home kid like once you're in a group homes you're a group home kid mm -hmm. and that doesn't go away um and it's about you know this, this guy theo that's out in the world and he's able to get by but he's also missing certain tools he doesn't have a safety net um and theo you know was a stand-in for me in a lot of ways so mm -hmm. it's still a novel i mean it's my experiences but it's also a lot of the experiences of the people that I knew in the group homes bundled up into this character. It's almost like, in a lot of ways, a worst-case scenario. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like all the really bad things that happened to me and everybody I met in the group homes, I put onto Theo. Mm -hmm. uh, so rather than, you know, rather than saying, like, the best-case scenario, which is the guy that's going to grow up and write a book, is the best-case scenario. Uh -huh. Which would uh, be you. Yeah, which would be me. It's actually, <laughs> this is the worst-case scenario. This okay. is actually what happens to everybody else, a lot of them. But also um, exploring uh, s and M. Not from the perspective of, like, why, does, why is this person in s &M? mm -hmm. It's not about that. It's more about why does this person have an unhealthy relationship with his desire for mm -hmm. s &M? Why can't he accept this in himself uh, and, and express it in a healthy way? Because uh, that's, in a lot of ways, it's Theo's problem. He has these desires, but he doesn't know how, what to do with them. He comes from this extremely macho environment. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and he doesn't, he hasn't had someone accepting a positive in his life. So, uh, he has an unhealthy relationship with his desires, but people are, are reading the book wrong to think that because of his history, that's why he's in S&M. Mm -hmm. That's not true. It's, it's because of his history that he has an unhealthy relationship with his desire for S&M. Mm -hmm. And those are two different things. Now, one of the points of Theo was that he had, as in the book, a pedophile caseworker who raped him, but also protected him from other people. So there is that kind of abuse and love at mm -hmm. the same time from a person, the same person. Yeah. And so does that have anything to do, do you think, later on in life with his association of those two things? Yeah, I think there's some of that. And I think that that's really common among abuse survivors that they turn to people who are abusive, uh, that they can't accept that someone would love them who mm -hmm. isn't abusive. They start to equate affection with abuse, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and I think that I've done a lot of that. You know, my father was abusive, uh, especially verbally, you know, this continual uh, ridicule um, and verbal abuse that I think, uh, you know, you internalize. And so this is your parent, and this is what affection means, right? Because affection is that thing that comes from your parent. Yeah. And so uh, when you meet someone, you know, you're kind of looking for that. And someone that's just like, oh, you're so great. You're like, that's nice to hear, <laughs> but I'm not really feeling that's that. That's not love. Yeah, I don't really feel that. Uh -huh. um, so how do you, like, l allow that to come in, mm -hmm. you know? Now, how is it writing somewhat autobiographical things um, about very sensitive parts of your life? I would think that people would resist doing that or not want to do that. But there are some artists that really open up and talk about very personal things. Well, how does that feel? Well, I think it probably feels the way uh, a transvestite feels the first day they go outside in a dress feels good okay you know it feels really good to step out of the closet um people can't tear you down for things that you're open about uh oh. and so i think that it's i think it's really i think it's i think it's healthy uh you know my, my all my friends i was very closeted about s and m and then my friends were reading happy baby and they were and they were all like oh that's what he's into that kind of explains certain things and and various relationships the funny thing is, there's always another closet, you know. If you're gonna if you're gonna be out about something, mm -hmm. you're only gonna find that you're hiding something else. We can always go deeper. You're always hiding something, mm -hmm. and so coming out of the closet is actually a process of self knowledge. Um, 
and, and, and deepening, which I think is one of the great benefits of being a writer. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's certainly not the money. <laughs> no, I don't think I've ever seen read a writer that's just uh, rolling in dough. Yeah, so... And, um, but it does allow you to dig deeper into your psyche and open up more and more. And if, really... that, and if that's what you want, if you want self-knowledge, mm-hmm. writing is something that can, do, that can help you with that. Uh, I've also heard it said that there's a reason people, that you bury these things. You know, there's a reason you hide, hide things from yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. And I can understand that too. But if you, if you want to be a good writer, you have to learn how to put things out there and not be afraid and do you of think those things that's uh san francisco community very open and welcoming to your type of writing and do you think that that helps nurture you to go deeper here in san francisco i think that's true i mm. think that um if you're into snm san francisco is probably the best place in the world to be there's mm. probably there might be more people to date in new york but san francisco has this, inc- this incredibly uh open community. Also, you know, I, I used to be a stripper, so I've, been, I've done sex work. And in San Francisco, that's not a bad thing. Nobody cares. Mm-hmm. Nobody's going to judge you for that. It's like a lot of people look at that as empowerment in San Francisco. Um, and so I think that that's been really helpful for me, being open about my sexuality. Uh, San Francisco is such a uh, uh, loving community that way. Yeah. Um, so it was, and it's funny because I didn't end up here on purpose. I wasn't like, Oh, I'm going to go to this S and M Mecca. I was just, <laughs> you ran I was just lost. I was just traveling around. Um, also, most recently, you finished uh, writing about murders, part of mm. which was based on the Hans Reiser trial, and it's called the Adderall Diaries. The Adderall Diaries. It's a uh, half memoir and half true crime. Okay. Yeah. So it's not a novel. It's actually my first memoir. Okay. Uh, my first. Well, it's just like at this point, what's the point in fiction? You know, I've written so many books, so many uh, fic- so much fiction based around my experiences. Uh, the challenge is more interesting, I think, to write something true. I started it, uh, it's called the Adderall Diaries, because I took Adderall for many years, and then I stopped. I'm sorry, what is Adderall? Adderall is like Ritalin. Okay. So I had mm-hmm. a diagnosis of ADD, and I took a, lo- uh, a fairly small you know, amount, not, not crazy. Mm-hmm. But, and I, start, I had stopped for a while, and that wasn't working mm-hmm. for me. And so after a year or two, I started taking Adderall again mm-hmm. and just kind of writing what came to mind. And right around that time, a friend of mine was writing an article for Wired magazine about Han- the Hans Reiser murder trial. And I tried to help him get in touch with Sean Sturgeon. Mm-hmm. This gets a little complicated. Okay. Sean Sturgeon is Han- was Hans Reiser's best friend. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hans Reiser was accused of killing his wife, Nina Reiser. Sean Sturgeon is the guy that is Hans Reiser's former best friend and the man that Nina left Hans for. Okay. uh, And who she then left Sean as well. So this is, I'm going to say six or seven months after Hans has been accused of killing Nina Reiser. Mm Mm-hmm. And Sean Sturgeon comes forward and says, I've also killed eight and a half people. Uh, Eight and a half. Eight and a half. half I didn't know if one of them was dead. And Uh. Josh calls me and he says, your guy just confessed to eight murders. I said, well, it was not my guy, you know. (laughs) Right, right. Um, And and from that, that led to, I started researching that. Mm -hmm. I met with Sean a few times. Mm -hmm. Then he disappeared. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, but that that's what ultimately led to me writing this book, The Adderall Diaries, which is a tale of uh, Hans Reiser, uh, Hans Reiser murder trial, which I went to every day, mm-hmm. uh, the really uh, extensive police investigation into Sean Sturgeon, mm-hmm. uh, into Sean Sturgeon's ultimately false confessions. Through looking into these various stories, uh, I tell my own uh, story. That's amazing. And that, once again, the title of that? It's the Adderall Diaries. Mm-hmm. And when's that coming out? Not till September. Not till September. Great. You know what? We're already running out of time. I do want to talk to you about the rumpus.net. Would you come back and uh, have Anytime. another session with us? Sure. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Stephen Elliott. Um, please check out the, uh, the information on SF Live TV. You can find out more about Stephen. Have a good evening, and thank you for joining us on SF Live TV.